All right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Um, let's see, should we, what time is it now? I saw 3.02. I guess I'll just wait a minute or two for other, to pe other people to join. Um, Um, but I want to in particular give a shout out to uh, Lynn Turbeck, who reviewed these slides this morning. <laughs> it gave me some feedback. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to incorporate all of it on uh, such short notice, but um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end um, and I can go through some examples live and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> But um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of give an introduction to this library that I started writing back in 2016, actually. Um, it hadn't gotten much use, but I decided uh, that I kind of want to continue to build it out. Um, and in particular, it was kind of motivated by having to work with Abbevinder projects and realizing just what a pain uh, that can be. And so the goal here is really to try to make it easier. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of why that is. I guess uh, let's get started and as people join, um, they'll just catch up. And uh, I'm also recording this, by the way, um, so that we can post it online for people to watch afterwards. Uh, the slides are also available on the web and I'll include um, links to all of that uh, at the end too. So, um, AIA Tools is this Python library that I mentioned. Um, it's really intended to simplify access to App Inventor projects for data analysis purposes. Uh, if any of you uh, on the call have tried to do data analysis on App Inventor projects, you know that it's a somewhat cumbersome task. And so the real goal here is to try to minimize the amount of effort it takes to do some visualization of App Inventor projects and things like that. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the structure of an App Inventor project, uh, basically uh, an App Inventor project or an AIA file is just a zip file by another name. It's really composed of three main parts. Uh, there's the assets, which includes all of the media that you've added to a project, as well as any extensions that the project might contain. Uh, it includes the source files, which uh, are are the files for all of the screens in your app. Um, and there are multiple pieces to each screen. Uh, and then there's some additional metadata, which we call the project properties. So screen really is just a JSON blob. Uh, it exists inside of a scheme file. Uh, and so this JSON here, uh, which you see runs off the side of the screen, because we don't actually do any pre-printing or anything of that uh, in App Inventor. Um, this describes the entire structure in the designer. So as you add buttons, labels, arrangements, and change the properties of those components, um, all of that information is stored here. The blocks workspace uh, is stored in an XML file, uh, which comes from Blockly. Uh, and there's a few key pieces to the blocks file. So you have entries such as block, um, which you can see online too. Um, blocks can have fields uh, or mutations. Um, so a field is say like one of the drop downs that you would see on the block, uh, whereas a mutation is some property of it. So um, the, what, the blocks that mutate the most are the component blocks. So there's a single component event block, for example, um, but we store all this information such as the type of the component, whether the block is generic or not, what the instance is associated with it. Uh, and that information is used in order to reconstruct the block um, when the workspace is rendered. Um, and then the other two, or I guess other three really important things here, there's a value uh, field, which is um, any input sockets uh, on the, so the right-hand side of a block. There's a statement, which is, um, the nested statements. So for example, if you have an if block, you would have the test is a value, the what to do if uh, the statement is true uh, is the, the statement value. And then there's the next 
uh, element, which is on line 17 there, uh, which is the thing to do after the block executes. And so what ends up happening is even in very small applications, you get this very long sequence of next uh, nested next elements. Um, and so in a very small application, you can see it's maybe indented, you know, 10 or 12 spaces. Uh, but we had uh, one project that we were looking at uh, about, uh, I guess, two or three weeks ago now, uh, where a single event handler had over 10,000 blocks in it. And so if you're indenting, you know, four or six spaces every block, uh, you end up quickly with kilobytes and kilobytes of white space. So um, the whole blocks file was something like 55 megabytes. Uh, and that's being shuffled. So every time you save a project, uh, that file is getting shuffled back uh, from your client to the server. Um, and of course, working with this is very complicated too because it's this very uh, long sequence of, uh, it's basically a very long linked list. Um, and so it's not necessarily the most fun to work with um, when you're uh, trying to uh, decompose it into something that you can use in your analysis. Uh, the last thing I highlighted here too is uh, line 31. There's this YA code blocks, which is the um, the way we store version information about the language itself. And we use this to manage when to do upgrades uh, as we update App Inventor and we add new features to the language or change properties of components and blocks. Then uh, we use this in order to know what needs to be changed the next time you load your App Inventor project. And um, Managing that as well is really important because as the language has changed over the years, um, you need to be aware of what changes have been made so that you are looking at projects with um, sort of similar lens. So um, I wanted to be able to generate visualizations like this. <laughs> and if you look at the JSON and you look at the blocks XML, it, it's not very obvious how to go from uh, what you saw on the previous slide to what you see here. Uh, this is actually for a different app, which had many more blocks, just so we have something a little bit more interesting to look at. Um, but you can see here, we have a breakdown of the number of blocks in the project based on the different category of block, right? So you can see um, that math in this, this is a, a App Inventor version of Yahtzee. So math blocks are used quite a bit. Uh, variables are used quite a bit, uh, logic less so. Um, there's uh, you know a couple of procedures it looks like, a um, you know, bunch of component blocks and things like that. So you can get a very quick sense of sort of the structure of a program by seeing this type of visualization. And um, when I start working on this type of stuff, doing this was actually quite hard. So I've alluded a little bit to some of the motivation already, but the first thing was I wanted to be able to look at blocks in a logical way, right? So could we write something like length of blocks uh, versus traversing the linked list structure that the XML gives us? Um, the second was that I really wanted to be able to sort of build a whole repository of useful operations that we might want to conduct on blocks. And some of the things that are now in AIA tools have been sort of gifted to me in a way of someone saying, hey, you know, I really need to do this to answer this question on an app and then a project. And I just wrote a little bit of Python code uh, to make it happen. And so I've been sort of accumulating these things over the past four years. And part of my goal with this is to sort of help people become aware that this is a tool that you can use if you want to analyze uh, projects in App Inventor, and hopefully to get um, people to contribute their own ideas as well. Um, the third thing was I wanted to sort of think about, are there ways we could statically analyze App Inventor projects? Um, this has been a recurring theme while I've been at MIT. A number of your ops have worked on different ways of thinking about how to detect uh, problematic um, changes in, uh, when somebody's working with App Inventor and sort of give them a warning or a heads up beforehand. Um, I also know that uh, Lynn has done a lot of work on this too, and we continue to discuss ways that some of the newer uh, tools we've been developing, such as the real-time collaboration functionality, might play into that. Um, but in the end, what we really want to be able to do is have an easy way to analyze all of the screens, components, and blocks in the project to be able to answer our research questions, right? And so 
um, it's really important that we have a tool where we can spend most of our time focusing on answering the questions rather than writing the code. So back to uh, my little figure from before. Um, it wasn't obvious, as I said, how to make this from the start. Um, because again, working with the XML is cumbersome, especially in Python. Um, uh, but I wanted to make it simple, right? So this figure, uh, in terms of what AIA tools can do, is generated by these three lines. Uh, it's technically two lines, but I had to wrap to fit it on the slide without it uh, rolling off the edge. Uh, so basically we can open an AIA file, um, and then we can do AIA.blocks to get all the blocks in the project. And then we can count them and we can group them uh, by category. Uh, and what that returns is a dictionary that maps the category into the count. Uh, and then that gets rendered. Um, most of the bulk of the work is in this radar plot function, which ties into uh, matplotlib and sets up um, everything that you need to actually draw uh, the figure. But the actual extraction of the data happens in um, uh, just a very small sequence of function calls. Uh, and so the AIA file constructor is responsible for sort of going into the zip file, pulling out all of the screen uh, files, both the, the scheme and the BKY, the Blockly files, uh, and then constructing objects uh, that it can then execute these queries over. Uh, and there are a bunch of different objects. Uh, we have representations for blocks and components, as well as all the uh, block uh, component types. Um, and I can show you an example of that when we go to the live uh, portion. Uh, so here's another figure, um, different project, but again, it's the exact same code essentially. Um, and so now that we, again, we have these very simple examples, we can replicate them very easily. And so now anybody could, you know, if you're working on a paper around App Inventor and you've got a bunch of AIA files, you can generate uh, these types of figures very easily. And again, you know, it's just a handful of lines of code there. Um, another, a different type of question, maybe you want to look at the individual block type distribution. So you're not so interested in the category, but you're interested in the different types of blocks people are using. And so uh, in this example uh, for the same app, we see, you know, there's a couple of different component event and component method items, of, you know, a bunch of lexical variable get blocks uh, to a lesser extent component set get. Um, and so you can get a feel of the lay of the land of how a project is sort of put together a little bit um, by looking at this. And again, you know, the, it's a slight tweak of the last one. Uh, here we're grouping by type rather than um, the category. Um, and so just by changing one uh, small or tweaking one small um, attribute, you can get a completely different uh, analysis. So uh, I wanted to kind of give you some examples uh, of how uh, AI tools can work. So sort of starting with the very simple stuff and building up to more complicated stuff. Um, and so the easiest thing you can do, right, is you can load an AI file. Um, and um, when you have the AI file reference, you can then um, query, you know, what screens are in the AIA. Um, you can ask what components does it contain, what blocks does it contain. Um, you can do this both for an individual screen like I've done here, or you could execute these uh, calls on the AI itself and it will give you across all screens. Um, but you can see, for example, this, um, this particular uh, app was hello per, uh, and so it's got a button, it's got a label, it's got a sound, uh, and then it's got uh, a handful of blocks, right? So you click the the cat and then it meows and so those are the two blocks you see. Uh, you'll see uh, for the component output uh, the type of the component is rendered so it's a screen or it's a button or it's a label uh, and then the uh, in the case of components that aren't screens uh, you see the UUID that App Inventor stores internally uh, for that uh, item and then the label or the name of the component that the user gave it. In this case, I didn't rename anything, so it's just sort of the standard names. Uh, in the case of blocks, you get the block ID, uh, which Blockly randomly generates, uh, and then the block type, in this case, component event or component method. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, these are all um, 
these are all iterables, so you can call one on them and get the length. So you get, you know, two or, or four, um, respectively. Now, one of the cool things uh, that I really wanted to do uh, when I started AI tools is have ways of filtering the data. So not just, you know, okay, counting the number of blocks and number of components is quite simple. You know, can we start to filter and combine things in interesting ways um, so that we can ask more complicated questions, right? And so uh, the first thing I kind of implemented here was the ability to do some simple filtering uh, based on various checks and things like that. So you can write a call like this first one here where you can check that uh, the type of a component is a button and then just return the uh, set of those elements, right? And so um, obviously in, in Hello Per, there's only one. Um, similarly, if you wanted to filter the blocks, uh, you can say that ask for the type of the block and assert that you want only the uh, block types that are component event. And again, you in this particular case, you get a single block. Um, there are kind of more interesting ones. So you can say, give me only the top level blocks, i.e. a block that's not connected uh, to any parent. Um, and that's the, uh, the third call here. And so again, uh, in hello per, there's only the event block. Um, so it's a very small set. And then you can also say, give me all the leaf blocks, right? So give me something where um, it doesn't have any, any children. Um, and so you can start to think about, okay, well, how can I combine uh, these and make use of them in different ways? Um, so this allows you to subset your data uh, so that you can do additional analysis. Um, and once you have sort of simple filtering, I wanted to have ways of doing more uh, complicated things uh, and combining them ideally with the uh, sort of Boolean logic. Uh, and so that allows you to start writing queries like this first one where you can say, uh, give me all the blocks where the type is a component event and the event name is click, right? And so that would give you all of the click handlers in an app, whether it's a button or um, like a marker, if you add a map, uh, for example, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in the case of Hello Per, there's only the one button. Um, and then there are all sorts of different uh, attributes. So just to show you another one here, there's height. Uh, so you can ask what's the height of a block um, in terms of the, tr uh, starting from here, uh, you know, how many blocks down does the tree go? And so you can use this type of query to say, give me all the event handlers that have at least one block in them, uh, is this query, right? So it's a top level block and the height of the blocks, uh, the height of the tree starting at that block is at least one. Um, if you were to change it to be equal to equal to zero, then, um, you would get all of the empty event handlers, um, because in this case, the, the block does have a, the meow sound. So uh, you can use this again to like detect a certain things. So if you can imagine your projects that you're looking for, and you can imagine the criteria by which you wanna pull out certain features, then you can sort of write these queries um, and pull out uh, and detect the relevant projects. So again, disregard, you know, any project that doesn't meet that criteria and then focus your analysis on the ones that do meet the criteria. So there are a whole bunch of different uh, comparison operators uh, that you can use, um, you know, equality, all of the standard things are supported. Um, if you would like to negate an operation, you can, uh, or uh, an attribute, you can uh, put the unary not operator in front of it. Um, there's uh, infix binary operations, so you can do and and or, um, or for more clarity, there's and or not that are followed by underscores because of course and or not in Python are keywords and so you can't uh, override them, but um, you can say and two things or and three things uh, to combine them that way if you prefer not using the infix notation. Um, the important thing here, which I, I stumble upon every once in a while, uh, is that um, because of how Python evaluates order of operations, uh, if you want to use the and and the or infix, you have to wrap them in parentheses. And so you saw that on the previous slide uh, where we checked for um, that the type was component event and the mutation was uh, the click handler. Uh, so there are a whole number of attributes that you can query in AIA tools. Uh, they're what we call named attributes. Uh, so the type of a thing, uh, whether it's the block type or the component type, 
uh, what is its parent or the mutation of uh, the block. Um, then for example blocks you can do like statements and uh, values and all sorts of stuff like that. There are computed attributes. Uh, so these are not stored on the blocks themselves but are computed uh, dynamically when you request them. So the depth of a block within the tree, the height of the tree at a given block, uh, what's the root block for any given block. Um, those were all uh, computed at runtime. Uh, and then there's sort of special things for mutations and fields. So you can uh, get this mutation object and you can do something like dot is generic on it and that gives you a reference to the is generic flag of a block. If it has one, if it doesn't, then of course it will be false. Um, actually, I think it will be none, it won't be false. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to reference a field on a block, you can do fields.name or fields.component type or fields, you know, whatever fields you would query uh, in the blocks language, uh, you can reference them that way. Um, so the, the key thing for AIA tools is this idea of a selector, right? And so we've seen it a lot from the very first slide, right? So screens, blocks and components are the primary selectors uh, that you'll end up using most likely uh, when doing an analysis with AIA tools. Um, and of course, the sort of logically named, right? So blocks gives you all the blocks, uh, components gives you all the components and so forth. Uh, and you can chain these together too, right? So we saw you could do screens, uh, give me screen one, and then give me the blocks on screen one. Um, you can also do the, sort of the other way, right? So you can say, give me all the uh, button blocks and then tell me all the screens that they belong to. Um, you know, or you know, if you have a list view in, a, in an activity, right, you could say, give me, you know, just the activities that have list, or screens that have list views, sorry. Um, and as I mentioned, they're iterable, so you can do things like the length of the blocks and it outputs too. Um, there are some other types of selectors, uh, which I haven't already shown you, so there's select, if you have, say, a reference to a block or a component, you can create a new selection out of it. Uh, and then all of the other uh, pieces that you see here, you can call on that. Um, one that uh, I tend to use quite frequently is the descendants call. So given a particular block, give me all the descendants of it, or given a particular component, give me all the descendants of it. Um, in particular, uh, Lynn and I were working on a paper uh, doing loop analysis. And so this one becomes useful because you can actually generate um, all of uh, a sequence of objects from the single block and then you can do analysis on that sequence. Um, there are also two special ones that I added a while ago because uh, I was doing some work around procedures and so you can do callees and callers. So um, if you have a call block you can do call block .callees, and that will give you which procedure it calls. And so you could say, give me all of the caller blocks and then give me all the procedures they call. Uh, and you can do things like check to make sure that that set is equal to the procedures because otherwise there's something missing. Uh, callers uh, works the opposite way, right? So given a procedure definition block, find all of the blocks that call it. Um, and so you can use this to kind of jump around the, the call graph. Uh, in a future release, what I'd like to do is also maintain information about um, blocks and the components and events that they trigger. So imagine, for example, you have a web component and you do uh, web.get and then the uh, web.gottext fires. What you may want to know is for this got text event, where are all the places that that could be initiated from? within the code. And uh, we don't currently have that information kind of captured in App Inventor anywhere. Um, so I'm kind of like thinking about what, how we might uh, structure that information and represent it. Um, but then that way you could ha ask even more robust queries about how information flows uh, through the project. Um, there are other types of operations that you can do too. Um, so they're not really selecting uh, like the, the previous calls are, but they're doing some computation. Uh, so you can, uh, I've already shown you, you can say length of, uh, of a selection, but you can also do dot count on something, which basically gives you the same thing and slightly more natural way to read it. Um, and so here we have AI dot blocks uh, dot count, and that gives you two. Um, you can also then, uh, 
combine that with filtering. So you can give me all the top level blocks and then uh, count them and group them by height. Um, in this case, because there's only one top level thing, you only get one, but uh, in a much more robust project with lots of event handlers uh, and variables and procedures, you'll get a lot more. Uh, and then you can do things like average um, various attributes together. So there are really two classes of operations. So we have aggregation functions, um, basically average, count, max, and min. Uh, and then each of these can take the group by keyword if you want to group by a particular um, domain. And um, I'll double check the, the documentation, but I'm pretty sure I implemented that. You can give a tuple of attributes as well, and it will give you a matrix back um, grouped by uh, both, similar to an SQL group by keyword. Um, and then there are these other two operators, which don't really aggregate, but the one is empty, which is simply just checking to see whether the selection gave you uh, something back or not. Um, and then there's map, which is um, basically your sort of list or, uh, or scheme like map function where it takes a lambda and then uh, it returns you a new selection based on the results of that, uh, that lambda. Um, one of the cool things about AI tools is that you can make your own custom attributes. So I've written a whole bunch into the system already, um, but you can also make your own. Um, and uh, one of the other neat things is that AI tools is aware of all of the um, built-in components for App Inventor, as well as the blocks um, that the language provides. So you can do things like from AI tools block types import, um, you know, these two procedure types. Uh, which it knows about. Um, and then you can say, I want to create a new check, which is, is this thing a procedure definition? And that, that means that it's either a uh, def return or def no return, right? Uh, and then that now is something that you can pass to any of these filtering operations to get either of those two types. Um, and then of course, they're also composable. Um, so you can say an orphan block is a block that has a root node that is not a declaration. Uh, and so it will, when it's evaluating a block, it'll set, it'll first get the root block for that block, and then it will check to see whether that thing is a declaration or not. Um, and so you can use that to say, give me all, you know, all the blocks in the workspace that aren't really attached to either an event handler, a um, variable declaration, or a procedure definition. So, um, and then now these are, you know, these are just in our workspace and we can use them to uh, ask questions about our projects. Um, you can also define your own attributes by declaring them as a function. So I had written this check, which is sort of like a static analysis tool to just check if there's a possibility that a function uh, recursively calls itself. And so you could warn the user like, hey, you know, it looks like you might be calling uh, this thing recursively, you know, make sure you have a base case, right? Um, or some other way of exiting so that you don't end up in an infinite loop. Um, and so all this does is given a particular block, it grabs all of the callers of that block. Uh, and then it sees if those have any call blocks within them and just recursively goes through and builds up um, a possible set of um, ways of entering this loop. And if there ends up being a, um, a cycle on the graph, then it returns true. And if not, it returns false, right? And then uh, you can use this function by uh, passing it into say the blocks uh, selector where we check from the previous slide, we have the proc definition check and that proc also is inf potentially has infinite recursion. So, um, and then again, you know, you can string these along as uh, much as you need to to get uh, more and more refined queries. So um, I threw a lot of stuff out there, but I think the three big things to take away uh, from AA tools is one, it's extremely accessible. The idea here is really to make it easier to query App Inventor projects. You don't have to worry about parsing the JSON format of, uh, the, of the designer. You don't have to worry about parsing the blocks files. You don't have to worry about managing the fact that, you know, in language versions 18, a whole bunch of structure changed and, um, you know, managing the, 
the transformations that have to happen to make it consistent. Um, and because it's aware of all of the various parts of App Inventor, um, you can do all sorts of really neat things uh, with it. Um, it's composable, right? Uh, as I've demonstrated on the previous slides, there are lots of ways you can selectively filter data down uh, and combine it in order to get out the data structures you need for your visualizations or other analyses. Uh, and lastly, it's extensible, right? So you can define your own. You're not restricted to just doing or using the attributes and the, the functions I've written, um, but it's very easy to construct your own. Um, a lot of times they end up being only one or two lines of extra code. Uh, so it's not like it's a, a, a real effort uh, to generate new ways of uh, analyzing projects. Um, it's available on uh, PyPy, so you can do uh, you can install it with PIP3 install AIA tools and uh, start playing around with it. Um, it's open source and available on GitHub under the MIT CML uh, organization and AI tools repository. Uh, and then there's uh, some documentation available. I'm still working on a lot of examples and things like that. So if you're working on something and it doesn't quite seem to be working, feel free to reach out. Uh, and I'm happy to try to help people uh, learn more about this, learn how to make use of it, and you know, hopefully in the process also improve uh, the tool itself for everyone. So I'll take any questions at this point, and then if we want, um, I'm gonna I have a terminal open, and I can switch over to that, and we can uh, play around with some projects if anybody's interested. But uh, questions first. And then uh, if, also, if you want to see something, um, then let me know and I can try to show it to you uh, as well. Well, I was, uh, hello. I, was uh, say, I what, think everyone can unmute themselves if you need to. So just yeah, go ahead. No, I, so uh, the examples will be great, I think. And then just open a basic project and see how this works out that you will go to that point. I, I was just going to point out that. So. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Not sure if others have any questions, but I'm really curious. <laughs> because how many apps are out there that children have made, right? Uh, oh, um, we're up to, last I checked, of somewhere around 46 million, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure on the number, but it's a lot. Uh, it's definitely over 40 million. Um, and right, so uh, how do you analyze? Right, the, how do you analyze them is a really big problem. Um, for this this paper that uh, I mentioned that Lynn and I worked on, we had a smaller data set which involved only um, a couple million projects and. Uh, or maybe it's like 1.6 million or something like that. But um, we ran it on 48 cores running an analysis uh, and that still took about an hour, I think, um, when you parallelized it. So, um, yeah, it, it obviously also depends on the complexity of the analysis you're trying to do. Uh, we were trying to do this loop extraction, which I believe was cubic in its implementation. Um, and I don't think you can get much better than cubic, but uh, but that you know obviously takes a while, especially for larger projects. For smaller projects, it goes very quickly, but for larger projects, it would hang up sometimes, uh, chugging through. So, so the children are uh, making their project in specific age groups. I guess the the older children they're making more complex projects, and you can observe them also. Uh, well, in this particular data set, we didn't have any information about the users. It was completely um, uh, de-anonymized. So mm -hmm. uh, all we had was the project files and uh, ID, which I believe corresponded to their user ID, but um, we didn't know like what their usernames were or anything like that. Um, and we don't, in App Inventor, collect demographic data on people anyway. So okay. um, maybe age that huh? put my meaning age yeah. yeah right well so we class sort of level had a, grade level yeah we don't even have that but <laughs> <laughs> um uh, what we did what, the data set in question has um 
basically a random sampling of users and then there's a set of prolific users where prolific is defined as having 20 or more projects mm -hmm. um and so That's those mean. are people who probably are either more advanced or been using app inventor for longer so um maybe they are instructors okay yeah and they could be instructors right so um i think there's uh 46 000. at the time the data was collected there were 46 000 people who met that criteria so, um, but again, yeah, we don't know if they're instructors. Uh, if we were to collect that today, uh, I'd be in that group and I've got probably 500 plus projects, but a lot of those are also like test, you know, test this thing, test this, that thing. Uh, somebody sent me a project that doesn't load. So I, you know, pull uh, it. Even I applied for a data analyst position on edX. I'm not sure I will get in, but what you do here is just great because to analyze a large, online learning platform like that is just requires such tools. So I think it's really nice what you do because it, it, it can, it's needed in any large online learning place. So, mm -hmm. so if you can go through some examples that I think that's interesting. Okay, sure. Um, does anybody else have any other questions before I move over to the terminal? So this is, hey, this Evan. is oh. <laughs> Sorry, we're also talking, I don't wanna. Hold on. Okay, so this is Lynn. Um, so I want to say one thing. So first of all, Evan has done an absolutely fabulous job on this. Um, I've been working on data analysis and various versions of App Inventor since like 2012 um, and have, have analyzed these uh, 1.5 million projects in other ways. Um, and when working with Evan a few weeks ago, um, was kind of forced to learn the AIA tools to understand some code that Evan had written and realized how much simpler it was to use Evan's system than sort of the ad hoc things that I was using. So I wanna give a big shout out to Evan to, uh, for creating such a wonderful system. I mean, basically it's a, it's a mini language that makes it really easy to uh, walk over the different kinds of JSON and XML structures, but hiding that all behind a really beautiful high-level interface. So it's it's really gorgeous to use, and it's it's a pleasure to use. Uh, I also want to say a little bit about demographics. So while we don't collect demographic data for App Inventor, we do have some uh, demographic uh, data from people who voluntarily submitted information way back when. Right, that's true. Um, in that in that data, it turns out that uh, App Inventor has a much wider age age great yeah, age group range than say Scratch does. So Scratch is primarily used by middle and high school students, uh, but App Inventor actually is used by a lot of twenty and thirty year olds as well as younger people. Um, and there's quite a few people who even use it up to their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So uh, it really isn't just kids. Uh, it has a much broader range than Scratch does. But that, again, was based on voluntary data, and who knows if the older people weren't sort of uh, represented more in those volunteers. So it's a, little, it's a little difficult to say. That's all I have to say. Okay, this is uh, Mark. Uh, First of all, Evan, yeah, fantastic job. This really looks great. I mean, I don't have the experience that Lynn does, but I can sort of, I could sort of smell a good looking interface when I see one. Um, but I also have a question for you and maybe for Lynn too, since he's done a bunch of analysis. I wonder if you've thought about uh, or done any work on taking the stuff and sort of pushing it into some other database model, maybe relational, maybe not, maybe spreadsheet, maybe not, uh, to, to be able to make use of the sort of other kinds of tools and queries that you, know, you might be able to do, uh, as well as take advantage of the performance that might be uh, available to you if you used some you know, real professional database system or something like that. So yes, uh, <laughs> as of, you know, um, <laughs> let me, let me uh, give it a little bit more detail on that. Uh, in particular, because we also, I recently, in I guess September, ran a uh, 
a backup of the App Inventor database, um, the clouds, um, just the, the data store in uh, Google Cloud, which came in, clocked in at like 860 gigabytes or something like that. Um, and I've been trying to think about ways that maybe we could use AIA tools to sort of get some high level statistics out of those projects so that we could sample them for future research. Um, and yeah, the big challenge of course is with 40 million plus projects is that even a handful of attributes quickly grows into the gigabytes in terms of storage. Um, and so I would like to build something like that. Um, I think we just need to be very careful picking what attributes are going to be most valuable um, for analysis. So obviously, you know, one of the criteria we use a lot are just how many projects and how big are the projects uh, in terms of number of blocks and components and things like that. Um, so those very high level statistics. And then uh, from there, you can, you know, sort of select based on those high level criteria um, and then maybe run a more detailed analysis um, that is targeted towards whatever your research question is because uh, we can't, you know, compute all possible permutations effectively infinite. Um, but uh, yeah, so, some sort of uh, database where we could actually get some very high level stuff um, and just be able to quickly drill down to interesting projects that we can then run deeper analysis on, I think would be very useful. And like I know Scratch uh, uses Elasticsearch and they build all sorts of statistics and load those in. Um, and so, you know, a solution like that where they can very kind of get it, very quickly get a sense of like the overall distribution of, of scratch projects and then kind of dig down um, for uh, research. Uh, something similar for App Inventor I think would be extremely valuable, not just for MIT, but for the whole community of researchers around App Inventor. So um, it's definitely a vision of something that I'd like to be able to do and want to do. It's just you know, time and resources problem. Thanks, Evan. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna do that. All right, um, so this is my terminal now. Uh, I've just kind of, all I've done here is I've, I'm running um, IPython and I've loaded everything from AIA tools into it. I, I'm just doing that because I'm lazy. <laughs> uh, you could, um, there are different uh, sub modules and things if you look at the documentation that contain different parts, but uh, this is the uh, the cheater's way of doing it. Just you can do import everything from AIA tools, and that gives you all the block types, all the component types. So I can you know say but go away. I can say button, and I get that this is AIA tools component types button. Um, you know if I want uh, you know then this is the block type for the procedures call uh, no return no return. It tells you that the category is procedures, and it's got this. Uh, block kind value uh, value um, and uh, so um, let's see what else can we do uh, let's actually open up a project so I can open an area file uh, I showed the Yahtzee one earlier so let's do that uh, if you wanted to know how many blocks are in this you can just do uh, blocks.count so there's 1,245 blocks in that particular project. Um, and, you know, uh, so from the example I also did earlier, you can do count uh, group by uh, type, and then it gives you this dictionary um, where you kind of get a breakdown of all the different uh, block types that are used. Um, you could also do, for example, yeah, components uh, dot count group by type, and then you can get a distribution of the different component types there. So this is mostly uh, a UI composed of arrangements, buttons, labels, and a couple of, uh, I guess it's really all labels, right? Um, but again, it's just, it's, it's Yahtzee, so it's like you click a button, uh, it rolls the dice and then it outputs all the sums and things like that and keeps track of all of that. So, um, so from the complexity of the UI is uh, a lot in the sense that there are lots of 
uh, individual components, but there's very few uh, components used overall in terms of the number of types. So, um, so you can do that. And then, um, let's see. So we should be able to do things like uh, blocks type equals, um, Let's see, do we have any global declarations? Yeah, yeah so there's a handful. How many of those are there? Again, just the ten, 10 different globals. You could say, give me map fields dot, I think it's name. Yeah, so these are the names of the global variables in the project. Um, you now, similarly, let's see, all right, do we have any? Is prop mock? That's not right. Oops. Okay, a couple of procedures. Um, and then if we want the names of those, it's name. All right, so here are the names of all the procedures in the, um, and similarly, I mean, you can do this for all sorts of things, right? So components, if you wanted the names of like all the buttons, case there we go uh right because fields only really works for blocks it's not a component thing um but you can see okay so here are the names of all the buttons right so you can do so you can do stuff like this and then like if you want to say okay um you know how big is the procedure or the block uh, for reset um see if my how this work? Nope. Okay. Um, no, we can do this. So blocks. Give me. Uh, let's see. Mutation dot uh, instance name equals reset button. So here's the um, the probably the click handler for the button. I can't imagine it's anything else. But let's see. Um, mutation dot event name. Yes, so let's click. And then you could do things like give me the descendants. So how big is the, um, so the reset button apparently has only two children. Uh, let's see if we can do like, um, Type equals um, mutation dot equals button dot click uh, dot um, map height. So here's an example where we get all of the click event handlers and then um, we get the heights of those handlers. So like the tallest one here is uh, just 10 blocks tall. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But um, then we could do something like, I uh, wonder if this will work. Nope, okay, never mind. ignore. Um, Let's see, but you could take any one of these. Actually, we could do this lambda x uh, return length of x, select x dot descendants. All right, so here what I'm doing is for the click handlers, I'm selecting the handler block, getting a list of its descendants, and then computing the length of that. I could have also done dot count rather than using len. Um, and then here you can see, for example, the longest one is 136 blocks long, uh, that event handler. And then there's a slightly shorter one at 122. Um, and so let's see, then you could also, so then actually we could then say something like, let's see.
And um, I think I can do this. Let me see. Also, sort of inventing the stuff we got right. And so then now I've got the the particular block that is the that length, and then I could you know do convince on that and then it gives me the actual sequence of those blocks and so actually one of the things that Lynn and I were doing uh, when we were working on our papers we were trying to build these sentences um, that represented the sequence of things that were happening in the block or in the event handler and then we were trying to find uh, chunks of repeating uh, items in that sentence and so I had done this he asked me if we could have a, a thing that could figure out the kind of a block and so we can do, actually, we can just do this. Well, lambda x, you can say, um, type of x, actually we want to, we had kind first, kind of x, type of x. And so you end up with this sequence, which is basically um, for each block in the event handler, uh, so obviously the event itself is first, it's a declaration block, uh, this is the type of it, uh, then the next thing is a statement, it's a, a variable set, and so on and so forth. Um, you can see, are, do these sequences repeat over, you know, find a subset of the sequence and does it actually repeat multiple times. Um, and we had the type of the thing because we wanted to be able to say, like, you know, only consider uh, repeats from the start of a statement because it doesn't make sense to just have a value repeated. It has to be contained with some other thing. Um, and so we have uh, something like that. We wrote code to basically take this and try to find where there are repeats in the code. Um, and so that, that, that gives you a different way of looking at uh, the structure of the event handler. Um, let's see what else. So I had, um, so in the repo, if you go and you check it out, there's a sample.py, which has all of the code for the figures. If you want to test those out, I don't know that I, I can run it from the command line, but let me try it. Um, right, it's, yeah, it's upsetting me because I'm running in the terminal. Um, so we'll, we won't do that demo for now, but uh, you're welcome to run it yourself um, on your own machines and try it out. I'm curious if anybody has any particular things that they would like to see in terms of like, oh, you know, I'd like to know X about a project. How might I accomplish that? Let's see what other projects do I have. I'll go in here. Slow the window color now. So, anyway, so this is um, an example of uh, John. Yeah. Topical. Uh, so in the 1800s, um, when there was a cholera outbreak in uh, London, um, John Snow, who was, I guess, in a way, uh, sort of a grandfather, father of epidemiology, but sort of, he got the idea that maybe you could use some sort of scientific approach to figure out why people were getting sick and what the source of the illness was. Um, and he collected a lot of data points of who was getting sick and where they lived. Uh, around London, and he was sort of able to triangulate that there was a particular well um, that uh, was problematic. Uh, they shut off the well and the people got better, um, or the pump, it was a pump, not a well. Uh, and so this app was sort of demonstrate that it had, it's a map and it loads up um, some point data uh, and then draws the location of all the pumps. Uh, and so you can sort of get some information about um, about that. So it's a little demo app I made uh, back when we added maps to App Inventor. Um, so you can see things like, uh, you know, give me the map. I think it's got a marker on it too. All right. So um, in this particular case, because things are getting loaded dynamically, we had one um, dummy marker to provide all the blocks we needed for everything else. Um, but then you can look at, you know, the blocks. Um, and let's say uh, component type. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, I can just say type. 
uh, mutation component. All right, so you can see that most of the blocks here are um, related to markers, a couple for maps. Um, and you could, you know, again, you can start to do all sorts of stuff for you. Um, actually, we don't need to do map here, we just do count. Mutation dot component type. All right, so you can get a distribution of the blocks in the project and how they're related uh, to the component types. I'm sure we could do the same thing for Yahtzee as well. All right, so there are 135 uh, blocks related to buttons, 36 to labels, nine to notifier, and one to form. So uh, it's probably the form screen dot initialize or something like that. Um, yeah. So again, you can sort of see a distribution of how the blocks uh, interact with uh, everything else. Um, and then I guess you could also, I mean, that just covers the blocks that are related to components. There would also be the ones that are not uh, related to components. Um, so a way you could do that is you can do this. So here now I'm using the um, the not unary not to negate this. So I'm basically saying tell me all the blocks that don't have a component type. Fine, code works. Yep. And so now here here's a breakdown basically of all the blocks that aren't related to components. Um, so that you could then say, you know, look at the distribution of, you know, you could do, there's that, there's 1,064 not related to components, and then there's 181 that are component blocks. So um, you can imagine now maybe one of your analysis is how much do people use component blocks versus not uh, in a project, and maybe that's a function of what the project's trying to do or whatever, the particular task, if you gave students a task uh, to accomplish. Um, you could look at how they break that down. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of a quick whirlwind tour uh, through area tools. Um, you know, I'll hang around for a little while. Let's see, oh, it's, it's four o'clock now, but um, so if you have other things, the uh, meeting was going to end at four, um, but if you wanna hang around and ask questions, um, feel free to stick around and I'm happy to talk. Thank you so much, Evan. Imagine you're hearing a big round of applause at this point. <laughs> yes. And uh, let me go, I'll just leave this up for here uh, now if you wanna take, uh, take down the URLs or anything. And I'll send around the URL uh, to the App Inventor lists um, for the slides, because uh, I realized I forgot to put that on here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and if you, if you do end up using it, and if you uh, have any ideas, uh, feel free to either file an issue on GitHub uh, or make a pull request. Um, I'm happy to uh, consider contributions. Uh, Ivan, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, once I get more into depth with my um, reinforcement learning basic mini game, I, I'm, I will end up probably using this to assess how complicated a three by three versus four by four by five by five uh, algorithm operates. So I, I might end up using that, but I have to just get it working first. All right. Great. I'll reach out to you later. <laughs> you know where to find me. I will need your help for sure. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, hey, Vic. I don't know. Hello. Um, so when you were talking about like the like children and parents of different blocks, I was just thinking it was like super similar to what we're doing in SE1 right now in a way. And I'm just like curious if you've like done this or if you're thinking about like making it possible to like visualize a tree of like parents and children blocks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Sure. Um, I mean, I, I haven't written any code to that effect. I mean, in a way, sort of loading the project into App Inventor is the easiest way to visualize the tree structure. Um, but there's also the slight thing, I guess I didn't talk about this actually, but uh, in AIA tools, uh, I do maintain the linked list structure. So for any given block, you can do dot next on it to see what the next block is. Um, so it follows the XML convention that way. But then there's also things like uh, logical parent as a property. So for a given block, you can ask what's the logical parent of this block, which is not the next, the immediately preceding block. Because uh, if you've got a sequence of statements, you don't actually necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that the one before is the, and it is the parent from the point of view of Blockly, but logically you might want to say the logical parent for some statement is really the event handler it's contained within or the if statement it's contained within. Um, and so that way you have this idea of sibling statements. And so you can say, what are the length of the statements in this if statement uh, versus, you know, it just always being, you have to get the next, you have to get the next, you have to get the next. Um, so you have both views. You can both view it as um, the linked list type approach, or you can view it as the sort of tree-like thing where uh, you have a sequence of statements that are all at the same level. And then if you have like a if statement or something, then the children of that if get nested another layer down. But I don't have a visualization for that, but the structure is present uh, in the objects themselves. So. You could you could probably make the visualization. Um, I haven't. Uh, I don't know enough Matplotlib at this point that I could easily do that on the call, but it would probably take me a couple hours. So. Uh, I have just a fancy question that came up to my mind. So, uh, there. How do you see? any insights using these tools that could improve the usage of uh, the platform? Like, because you must be thinking about the best uses of these tools that you created and uh, how can that affect the uh, growth and the user experience of the people and how can that lead to some insights? Because uh, it's good, it's, it's used for reporting purposes, my understanding right now. And uh, just curious because, uh, there's not much, exp there are not many such large platforms out there about education. And uh, I've just applied for a job, as I said, on edX as a data scientist. And I see that there's a lot of SQL and scripting and probably also generating reports and uh, reporting this to the management. And uh, I can see uh, how, how do you envision using these tools, not necessarily on App Inventor, but on other similar platforms, mm -hmm. let's say Scratch or even edX or in the broader sense right. of things. Sure. Um, the yeah. So the blocks support is intended to be reusable. Um, it just parses the blockly um, files and converts them into its own internal representation. Um, there's no reason you couldn't use it for analyzing Scratch projects or any other. Um, tool that's built on Blockly, assuming you can get access to the XML uh, under the hood. Um, so that's, I mean, it's certainly the case that uh, that piece of it, you know, could be used in a lot of different ways. Um, now, the thing that it doesn't have is you'd have to provide information about those blocks so that you could write the queries efficiently. Although in most cases, um, the system will allow for a string um, in place of an actual reference. Um, so I guess if I go back here, um, so I could, you know, before I was doing, you know, um, type equals say uh, procedure def no return, right? But I can also do this and it gives me the same thing. So even though it doesn't know about all of the block types that say Scratch uses, um, you could still, if you know what those are, you could just code it as strings and it will do the right thing. Um, you know, so, and there are a lot of projects out there now that are using um, Blockly as uh, a framework for coding, uh, especially things that are targeted towards kids. Um, you know, code.org has its own 
platform now. Um, Microsoft has a whole bunch of different things under the make code umbrella. So um, again, if you can get the XML out of those, then you can you know write your queries on top of that. Um, there's a um, so I think it's uh, let's see. Um, Block has a from XML. Uh, so you want so there's a little bit of work you have to do. Um, I didn't write documentation for that yet, but uh, so that's one of those internal things. But um, you you could use this. So you just have to iterate over the the top level blocks in the the workspace XML and call this function on it, and it will produce the actual representation that uh, AIA tools uses. And then you just run these queries uh, like so. Um, and I guess the other thing I didn't mention, uh, but it's in the documentation, is the AIA file object can take both a, a zipped, like a standard AIA file, but it can also take an unpack thing. So if you just have unzipped the project somewhere, you can pass it the directory and it will pull in all the BKY and SCM files from the file system, and construct the project internally. Um, so there's some flexibility in that as well. Uh, but that constructor just reads the XML file in, right? And so you could just repurpose that code to read from a different provider. It doesn't have to be an App Inventor. Um, project in that case. So um, I do th I do think that hopefully, you know, this gets some traction because of that, and that it makes it easier to even do analysis of others. I mean, obviously right now it's very tied to App Inventor and my primary motivation to build it was really to do App Inventor analysis, but um, I'm really kind of, I'd be excited to see people using it for something other than App Inventor as well. Uh, yeah. Just um, one more question. Sure, you, yeah. Uh, so um, in the job description that I just read today, it was about analyzing clickstream data as well. And uh, maybe there's a usage statistics where people click as they build the app. Is there something mm -hmm. like that? Uh, um, so that's something that I intend to add to AI tools at some point, um, but it's not currently there. Uh, the reason for that is um, we did a study uh, I guess it was about two years ago now. Um, so Mike Tissenbaum, and, uh, who's a research scientist with App Inventor, and uh, Mark Sherman, uh, who's a postdoc, and then uh, Karen Lang, who was our director for education and business development, did a project at um, Malden High School. And as part of that system, uh, we leveraged a bunch of different research technologies that we've built for App Inventor. Um, so one was Mark had uh, for his PhD thesis written a feature for App Inventor that could take get snapshots of a project. So every time your project saved, it would make another snapshot in a Git repository for your project. Um, so you could see the development of the project over time. Uh, that also contained a relatively early version as well of our real-time collaboration functionality. And so uh, we were logging the stream of events going between the client and the server. And so the, the Git snapshot could basically showed you sort of these five second intervals as the project evolved, but then you could look, go and look at the, the stream of operations that was going on and use that to get finer green detail about exactly what people were doing uh, between the five second save windows. Um, there's also a audio video component where we capture what the people are talking about and we looked for things like, so Mike uh, had a script that basically looked for when did the people introduce a certain component or use a certain type of block um, in the, the Git repo because you could use AI tools on that and then you could look at the stream data, you could look at what they were talking about from the audio data. Um, you could see what the screen looked like in yeah. terms of if they had yeah. other content like PDFs or whatever up or something. Um, so it gave, you, it gave us a very rich sort of overview of what was going on throughout the course of this class, and it ran for an entire semester. Um, so we had quite a lot of data um, from that uh, to do very rich analysis. But you know, the limitation here of AI tools is it's really right now looking at the project file as a single entity. Uh, so a version that could 
also tie into the stream behavior or stream data and analyze it for behavior uh, is actually something that'd be quite useful. We did have a Europ, uh, Lisa Ron, who uh, did do something like that, not in Python, but uh, in JavaScript. So it could tie into the, it, it, it registered itself as a participant in the real-time collaboration system and then did analysis on the events as they came in. And we had a very sort of primitive UI for uh, giving teachers a summary of like what blocks were students using. Um, yeah. And so the idea would be, you know, leveraging that to help detect certain behavioral patterns that are negative. Like negative and then um, yeah. Lynn and I are also talking about uh, detecting uh, so this loop detection thing, we're doing it post hoc, but uh, if you could, as people are copy and pasting um, blocks, for example, you could say, hey, you know, don't copy paste. Instead, you could use a loop, right? And, <laughs> um, you know, so so having like active interventions uh, based on information that we learn about projects and how people build projects and then feeding that back into the system to try to make App Inventor um, more useful. Uh, so um, I guess the best example we have right now of this is um, up until about a year ago, we didn't have generic event handlers. And so if you wanted to have like a game with lots of sprites, um, you had to basically copy and paste the event handler over and over and over again. And so you'd have you know 30 or plus event handlers maybe doing the exact same thing. Uh, and if the person was kind of clever about it, they would realize they could put it into a procedure and then have all the event handlers call the procedure. And then uh, that procedure would have the shared behavior. Um, and so we added the generic event handling and then all of that collapses down. So you could just have a single event handler and so you can actually look and see, okay, well, what bad, not necessarily bad things, but where are people doing repetitive stuff and how could we make it so it's not so repetitive? Oh, <laughs> you know, and no, it's, so it's that's important. Yes, it's a good right, thing. right. Um, and, and really the idea there being is to help people understand abstraction and learn about abstraction because then that becomes a very valuable tool in their toolkit going forward. Um, but if you don't give them the opportunities, then it's really hard for them to really know, especially if they don't have a teacher or mentor looking over the shoulder saying, hey, by the way, you know, there's a better way. Yeah. So, um, of course, we don't want to create Clippy for App Inventor. So, <laughs> so it's a very fine line we'll probably have to walk. Why is Clippy not popular? Like if it was too uh, not nice or it was giving too not smart advice for us for some time or... Uh... Um, it was annoying. I'm going <laughs> to decline the comment. Uh, <laughs> I thought when it first came out, it was a really good idea because I remember just using even yesterday, I was using Google Docs help file to uh, play reduce the header size on my CV and just like uh, I didn't know how to. I, I wish there was a clipper and I could just ask it. I had to Google search how to do it. Just saying. So. Yeah. Well, you know, part of it might be it just was before its time. Um, I mean, a lot of people now use voice-assisted things to, sure. you know, Alexa, Cortana, Siri, Google, um, to do all sorts of stuff, uh, you know. And so I can imagine that, it, you know, there'll be a return of Clippy maybe at some point or in, in some other form, potentially. Some other, I mean, like Cortana in a, in a sort of voice-assistant way, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Like in Google, they have this sort of Google Insights inside of spreadsheets and uh, docs and stuff where it kind of uses, you know, the power of cloud AI to help you do things, whatever those things are. So, I, I don't use those features of Google Docs yet. Just I'm just an old, old school user. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I think there's a thin line between helpful and annoying. And yes, that's probably it true. It was on the wrong side of that line. And maybe with more AI that can understand when you want help versus when you don't, sure. it would seem more natural. But when it's trying to help you and you don't want the help, it's very annoying. So another example, Tamir, of uh, using this kind of analysis is I had a thesis student at Wellesley who used the database of prolific projects uh, in a machine learning system. Database, can you repeat the uh, phrase just I couldn't get it? So, so used this set of prolific projects. Prolific, okay. These 1.5 million projects 
um, a, in a machine learning system mm -hmm. uh, that was trained against the state of your current screen. And so based on the state of your current screen, it would suggest like up to 10 blocks that you might want to use in your project based on other projects that people had built. That, so that's good. Say, that's like a recommendation engine. What your next step would be, it would say, oh, why don't you try using one of these projects? Why don't you try one of, these, one of these blocks? So that's, that's an good example idea. of how to leverage this uh, massive data that you have from all these other projects. True, true. That's, that's like a very good use case, I think. And uh... Well, it didn't turn out to be too useful in practice, actually. But it was a good idea. It needed, it needed a lot more work to be actually practically useful. Nice. Well, uh, I am, I'm trying to make a chess app for children, and uh, there's not even a good uh, artificial intelligence uh, voice assistant that will explain why a position is a checkmate or not. Just the basic telling the child that this position a checkmate because A, B, C. So, and uh, I, I can I can see how a basic recommendation engine just that doesn't offer ten options, but let's say three options can be meaningful for a child who doesn't have a tutor at at home or just like some some kind of interaction that he feels that he's interacting with something instead of trying to come up with everything by himself because many in many games that they that get children addicted they are offering a few number of options for children just not like an unlimited options like the, like all the blocks that they can use just in many games they are offering like a, a limited number of options and then little by little the games get more complex so i think a good recommendation engine like let's build this app like these are the blocks and put this that that this this, this is like a tutorial type of thing with with different storylines with different options i think that's attractive as a teaching tool and i think uh, i see app inventor having such feature in the future i mean not necessarily now but slowly by slowly All right. Well, there are, I mean, we have a number of tutorials uh, and we're in the process right now of um, collaborating with Technovation to try to build up a repertoire of um, video material. Uh, some of the people on this call are involved in that, the help with debugging, help with um, decomposing a problem into smaller pieces, evaluating, you know, um, how to design something uh, from an idea. Uh, and just kind of giving a, a richer set of uh, discussions around things. But yeah, of course, scoping um, the, the problem space such that it's not overwhelming uh, for beginners is a real challenge. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone uh, for coming and listening to me talk for over an hour. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it wasn't easy, but uh, I, if you have anything that you want to follow up with afterwards, uh, feel free to shoot me an email um, or otherwise reach out to me and I'm happy to help you out in any way I can. Right. Thanks so much, Evan. This was great. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.